Finding our purpose in life is something that we all have to deal with at one point in time, as purpose can act as sort of a compass that points our lives in the direction that we need to go to continue feeling satisfied. And because of this, those who have lost, or worse, never found their purpose can feel so adrift at life, trying desperately to fill that hole with anything they can find, be it their talents or actions, but without a passion or a purpose for their work, they are often unsatisfied, finding themselves becoming more and more a stranger in their own life. And the fear-fabricating, flexible figure flaunting femme fatale, fiercely fetishizing freedom, Mistral, is one of these strangers who finally found a place to belong within Desperado. Mistral is one of the major antagonists in the game Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, belonging to the enemy PMC Desperado, and more specifically their elite unit known as the Winds of Destruction. And from this unit, she is the first boss fight of the group that Raiden has to defeat during his work under Maverick. And because of this, she works as a great introduction as to what to expect from this game's bosses both narratively and mechanically, as well as being the first bit of foreshadowing for the game's final boss, Senator Armstrong, showing how much of a charismatic leader he must have been to completely win over Mistral's affection, and giving her something to fight for. Though before we dive too deep into that, let's discuss Mistral's name and design influences. So Mistral's actual name is never mentioned in a game, and she only ever goes by her code name that she earned within Desperado's Wind of Destruction unit, which, like all the members of the Winds of Destruction, derives from a specific weather pattern. And in her case, it comes from the strong cold winds which blow from the southern parts of France onto the Gulf of Lyon. Now this name was chosen partly based on her nationality as she was part French, but also because of her time fighting for the French Foreign Legion. Now design-wise, Mistral is a rather interesting case, as she has gone through a lot of significant changes in her initial design phase, and ultimately ended up as the perfect love letter to all the femme fatales within the Metal Gear series. Now, her design was done by Platinum Games concept artist Yohi Cho, after he was given general information by director Kenji Sato as what she would look like. Sato asked Cho to design a female with tendril-like objects coming out of her, which resulted in a lot of early concepts heavily focusing on her tendrils and ironically not her arms. Though neither party was fully happy with these initial designs, and Cho decided to reapproach the concept. He instead took inspiration from the Joragumo of Japanese mythology, a shape-shifting spider demon that tends to take the form of a beautiful woman who manipulates and lures in men into their web. Cho used this myth as reference and imagined Mistral with many arms like a spider. He then figured out he could easily accomplish this by having her wear the arms of the dwarf gecko UGs, even having them attached to herself. Though originally they looked a lot closer to to the tendrils that Saito wanted, though Chao would go on to modify the design a bit more and base it partially off the thousand-armed Avalokiteshvara, a Buddha Vista which embodies the compassion of all Buddhas, who went on to have their arms shattered in their attempts to reach out and assist all those suffering within the life cycle, though thanks to their compassion to help, they were gifted a thousand arms to achieve this task, and it would appear that at some point Mistral's character was going to play more into a twist on this design influence but we'll talk about that later in the video. Though, as it stands now, this design influence was likely decided on to sort of mock Raiden's ideals of protecting the weak that he harbors throughout half of the game, as Mistral was designed in a way to reflect Raiden's own history. Though Chao's approach to creating Mistral helped cement a design that he was both happy with, but also helped him forge her weapon as well, as Kenji Saito requested that she had a whip-like weapon, as it would add an element of mystery and eroticism to her movement. Set. Chao accomplished this by taking the interlinking gecko arm tendril idea and applying it to a pole arm. This way, it could curve and bend like a whip, even originally being wrapped around Mistral like body armor, but also it allowed her to stiffen or harden the weapon on command, as it fulfilled Saito's desire for an erotic moveset to match Mistral's already erotic design. And Saito's request here is likely why other elements of her character design are so sexual as well, be it the small things like how she was given a large jacket just so she could strip out of it seductively before her boss fight, to her hand and finger placements in Mistral's concept art and renders, along with the more obvious aspects of her design, such as her clear dominatrix silhouette with her heels and overall leather bondage outfit, right down to how she treats her minion UGs, 
teasing and torturing them through sensual caressing. Also, she was literally giving an ass-grasping hand chair in the DLC with some very subtle camera angles. Also, the tendril parts of her body didn't go completely unused, as in the second phase of her boss fight, Mistral gains an attack where she splits her weapons apart into two smaller whips, detaches all the arms still on her, and then combines them together into two larger whips, which then make large tendril-like weapons that she can grab the ground and pull herself closer to her prey, delivering a strong kick. This is also how she transitions to Phase 3. Though, longtime Metal Gear fans might have noticed that during her development, she bared a striking resemblance to a previous antagonist, this being the Beauty and the Beast unit from Metal Gear Solid 4, which is seemingly intentional, as she combines elements of all four of them into her design. Firstly, her original concept art is almost a direct lift from Laughing Octopus's design, including a large mask with massive tentacles attached to it that help her move around, though the mask, along with other pitches for mask concepts, were all revoked by Saito and Chao as they wanted Mistral's face to be revealed the whole time. And that works very well for her character, as much like her fellow Winds of Destruction, she has nothing to hide. She is blunt and honest about her feelings when conversing with others. Also, I find it honestly rather fitting that a design based off of Laughing Octopus ultimately got cut from the game, when she herself is based off of a fight that was cut from the original Metal Gear Solid. This obviously wasn't an intentional element of the design, I just think that it's a neat coincidence. Next, Mistral's many arms are assembled in a way that resembles Screaming Mantis's own beast form. Then, of course, we have Mistral's boss fight resembling Raging Raven, as a major part of Raven's fight is her use of adds in the form of flying UGs that she hides among and Snake can destroy for Drebin points in a similar way to how Mistral uses Dwarf Geckos. And then finally, her and Crying Wolf share a very similar backstory, having a common nationality with them both being born in Africa and having their early childhood ruined by rebellions, with Mistral being born in Algeria around 1980 and eventually losing both her parents to the Algerian Civil War when she was around 10 years old. Though, Mistral was also given her specific nationality for another reason, as a lot of Mistral's characters is heavily influenced by the Albert Camus novel L'Etranger, or The Stranger, and is more than just a low damage revolver. The novel was written to talk about nihilism in a strange but interesting way, as it follows the story of the half-French, half-Algerian man named Marceau, who, of course, is a nihilist. To him, life had no meaning, and thus he lived very different than most. He lacked motivation and a moral compass. Basically, he would do anything as long as he perceived it as practical, and it's demonstrated that he doesn't really feel anything as we show that he doesn't feel sad from his parents' own death or love from a romantic partner. Marceau, even finding the action of killing another person to be trivial, and could do it without hesitation if aggravated the correct way. And the only time in the story where we ever see Marceau express an emotion was when he was annoyed, one particular event being when he was sentenced to death and a priest kept trying to forcibly convert him to their idea. Ideology, causing Marceau to finally snap and tell off the priest, the book paints the public perception of Marceau as a monster or a menace, and this novel was a favorite of both Cho and Saito's during the work of Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, and they wanted to layer as many references to it in Mistral's character, even naming her polearm after the book itself. Though, where the death of his parent indirectly led Marceau down the path of murder, in the case of Mistral, it's what motivated her to take up the career, eventually tracking down the men who killed her parents and butchering them without much effort. And it was here that she learned that she was pretty gifted at killing. Soon enough, she fled her home country to France and joined the French Foreign Legion, which is an action that might be in reference to Susan Trevers, one of the only women in real life known to be part of the actual French Foreign Legion. And while working as a soldier, Mistral partook in many different operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, using her skills to kill dozens. She became so good at killing, actually, that it later became her area of expertise, being able to judge a weapon's killing potential pretty accurately by just minor observations. This is why she was later put in charge of the experimental LQ-84I UG. Though, even with her skills, which were unparalleled in her unit, she felt nothing while working, eventually developing some sort of envy for those that she would kill kill in her career, as they had a purpose and a cause to die for, while for her, she was just doing it because it was her job. Because Mistral has lacked an identity since she was born. She barely considers herself French or Algerian. She has no sense of purpose or identity, and the only thing that she understands about herself 
is that she's a killer. And because of this, she found herself respecting others in similar situations, like Raiden, who was born in Liberia and raised as a child soldier during the Liberian Civil War, and it ultimately damaged his sense of self as well. And because of their similarities, Mistral is one of the first people to see through Raiden's facade of a moral code of protecting the weak when deep down, she and him are both killers. Though soon Mistral would find a purpose, as she was naturally drawn to those who oozed the aura of their ideals. And this is how Mistral met Stephen Armstrong, a man who filled her empty heart with his fiery, passionate ideals. And for the first time, it gave her an identity, a cause to fight and die for. And this element of her story takes shapes in the lyrics of her boss theme, A Stranger I Remain. Though you might have noticed her story sounds rather familiar if you've played any of the other Metal Gear games. And this is because, other than the Beauty and the Beast unit, Mistral seems to be sort of a love letter amalgamation of most of the femme fatales throughout the Metal Gear series. Starting first with Sniper Wolf, who Mistral reflects of course in her stated fondness for wolves and dogs, but also the fact that she and Wolf were both saved by an idealistic figure. In Wolf's case it was Big Boss, and in Mistral's case it was Armstrong. They both also spend their final moments speaking not to their killer, but to the one that they admire most with Mistral even confessing her feelings for Armstrong. Then she takes elements from the dead cell railgun expert Fortune, with Mistral's haircut being partly lifted from Fortune's own concept art. As well as Mistral's past of hunting down her family's killer is similar in nature to that of Fortune's own quest for revenge against Solid Snake during the whole of Metal Gear Solid 2. Along with this, both Mistral and Fortune end up falling in love with the man who helped give them new purpose. She then takes elements from Snake Eater's own Eva, who is one of the most important characters in the whole of the Metal Gear series, and a very effective spy who is raised and trained by the world's best in a joint American, Russian, and Chinese facility. It's here where she learned to specialize in charming techniques in order to seduce her targets to achieve her mission. Though because of this, Eva never really had a sense of identity. She worked as a double agent for most of her life, and that made her allegiances questionable until she met Naked Snake, a man who even after she tricked and manipulated would go on to give her a sense of identity, someone who she could cast aside all other allegiances for. Mistral worked in a similar manner. Though she was never really a spy, she often operated with ulterior motives and manipulated others around her. We can even see her casually using her sex appeal to manipulate those around her, such as Andre Dulzev, who went on to mourn her death and took her final words as a confession to him instead of Armstrong. She even found her own naked snake, someone who not only gave her a cause, but also, in a way, seduced her back. 
Now, it would seem that Chao, Saito, and Atsutamari weaved all these details together into Mistral's character to make her sort of the ultimate Metal Gear girl, which makes sense given how passionately they all loved the series, especially Atsutamari. Though, interestingly enough, a lot of Mistral's character could have been different early on, as fans of Rising have extracted music from the Revengeance demo, and one of the files extracted appears to be what was once Mistral's unfinished or original boss theme, which seems to depict her views on war and fighting completely different than how we see her in the game now. She goes from this nihilist who was drifting through life and was ultimately saved and given purpose, which is an attitude that was directly inspired by Camus' novel, to someone who views their actions and murders as helpful and somber. Now, throughout the game, Mistral comes off as the most detached member of Desperado, given her willingness to get her comrades killed, and she's the only member of the Wind of Destruction we see not give a backstory reason as to why they turn into a cyborg, though if I had to guess the reason, based on her nihilistic themes, she likely didn't see her body as anything more than a tool that helped her achieve her job, and like a tool, once it becomes obsolete, you look to upgrade and replace. And we can assume a majority of her is cybernetics, judging by the spare body we fight later into the game. And her detachment from her group, along with her backstory and willingness to embrace her title as a killer, was all done to create a relation to Raiden himself, as Mistral is what a matured Raiden could have become, if he didn't establish his own identity at the end of Metal Gear Solid 2. Though, even as a tool for Armstrong, Mistral did possess traits that Raiden began to lack, most noticeably her honesty, as Mistral, while being a manipulator, doesn't hide her true feelings. She perceives herself as a killer and hopes Raiden would understand her because of that, but due to Raiden still trying to suppress his true nature, she lost most of her respect for him in their exchange. I protect the weak. <laughs> Still? So naive. And if I must kill to protect them, then so be it. Hmm. It seems we have less in common than I thought. 
though after her defeat, Raiden not only received her polearm, which is a fantastic sub-weapon for crowd control as while its damage isn't exactly high, it's quick and has a lot of decent range, as well as allowing the player to quickly rank up multiple hit combos for the purpose of the ranking system. But similar to that of the malice of a terrorist leader, Mistral's honesty flowed into Raiden after her defeat, and began to slowly infect him, as while he progressed throughout the game, his facade of protecting the weak melted away and Jack began to embrace the Ripper. Now I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you want to see more videos like in the future, I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash guy. And if you want to no longer remain a stranger, well I know you can find your identity through a copy of Shimonetta, a boring world with the concept of dirty jokes doesn't exist at buyshimonetta.com.